Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me tell you, it's indeed a pleasure to be once again in Greece and in this great city of Athens. Let me also express my appreciation to the Committee of Regions and to the Attica region and its president for organizing and hosting this sixth European Summit of Regions and Cities. I also want to extend my warm congratulations to the Committee of Regions on the occasion of its 20th anniversary, to all of you, leaders of regions and cities, my congratulations. Enhorabuena to para, para ti, querido amigo Ramon Valcarcel. Enhorabuena. Compliments to Mr. Valcarcel on behalf of the Commission and my own capacity. May I say uh, how impressed we are with the work of the COR? Over these 20 years, and the title of today's summit, European Recovery, Local Solutions, perfectly encapsulates the crucial and increasing role you are playing for the success of our growth and job agenda and for bringing the European Union closer to its citizens. I'm also very pleased with the extremely constructive cooperation which has developed over these years between the Committee of Regions and the Commission. Indeed, we are putting in place now in reality what the um, Treaty of Lisbon uh, has also allowed a stronger role for the Committee of Regions. And I've heard also what the Mayor of Lisbon, the Mayor of Lisbon never misses an opportunity to remind us about the Treaty of Lisbon, <laughs> that it was thanks to the Treaty of Lisbon that this is possible, but now we have to put it in practice because nothing replaces, of course, the political commitment, the political will. It's great to have a treaty that enables us to, to implement this principle of subsidiarity, but we have to do it even in a more effective way. All of you, you are leaders, European leaders from our regions, from our cities. I've been saying that very often. We cannot think that the European Union is just a mission for the European institutions in Brussels, in Strasbourg, or in Luxembourg. No. Europe is, in fact, a multi-level project and needs a multi-level governance. The idea of a hierarchy where there are up there them European leaders and here down the population, it's not an idea of the 21st century. We are, in fact, working in network. We need the commitment of all the levels. And this is what I understand by subsidiarity, not an idea of restriction, but on the contrary, an idea of democratic participation. And if we think that we can make Europe more accepted, more loved, only by the institutions in Brussels or Strasbourg, we are wrong. We need all the institutions. We need the Committee of Regions. But above all, we need the ownership of the European project and of the European policies by everybody at all levels in the ground that are implementing, for instance, our policies like EU 2020 or that have the responsibility of now investing the structural funds for investment and growth in our regions. You know firsthand how demanding these last years have been for the people of Europe, namely for the most vulnerable countries and here in Greece. Let me once again say that I deeply admire and respect the courage and dignity of our fellow citizens and here of the Greek citizens. We owe them a lot and I'm confident that Europe can now emerge from the crisis not only stronger but also more united and open. We have been through very, very testing times. These are moments in history when we reach a crossroads when uncertainties are high. These are moments when we have to embrace change, overcome the status quo, and take critical decisions that will reshape our future. We reached such a crucial tipping point when faced with the worst financial, economic, and social crisis since the start of European integration. We could have slipped towards disintegration, as predicted by many, or seized the opportunity to, for Europe to reform and to progress towards deeper integration. We have shown that those who predicted the demise of the euro and even the European Union were wrong. 
The stakes could not have been higher because our union is much more than an economic space. Our union is fundamentally a community of values, a way of life, peace and promotion of democracy, human dignity, solidarity, shared prosperity lie at the heart of the European integration. Recent events beyond our union, for instance in Ukraine and within our union, have shown how precious, inspirational, but also fragile these values can be. It would be a mistake to take these values for granted, peace for granted, or rule of law or democracy. We have to fight every day for that. And we have to do it for our countries and for our union. And I think we can say in face of this crisis that was the worst crisis of the globalization era, we fought back together. Under the most difficult circumstances, we managed to reinforce the foundations of our European house when it started to shake. A new awareness emerged that we could no longer avoid difficult decisions that would determine whether Europe remained an area of stability, prosperity and freedom. It was not easy, I have to tell you. I've been these five years leading the Commission, and the Commission is, I say sometimes, the engine room of the European Union. I've been in contact with all the governments of Europe, not only the governments of the most vulnerable countries, but also of the richer countries. And it is not easy, as responsible leaders, you know it's not easy, to have an agreement between countries, 28 countries, and in the euro area now 18 countries, that have different financial cultures. It's not only the difference between Finland and Greece. There are differences between Germany and France. And to put all this together in a democratic way, it's simply a very, I can use an expression from this Herculean task. It's a real Herculean task. And so it's true, some of us, and the Commission was in the front line, would like to have solutions faster, more ambitious. Yes, it is true. But democracy is not so, so rapid and cannot take decisions in such a speedy manner like the markets. And so we were, in fact, building the lifeboats in the middle of a storm. And this, uh, I think, has to be recognized because it's easy sometimes to say, OK, uh, things are not going well. Of course we know the difficulties, but we should, as responsible citizens, think what will be the alternative. The alternative will be to let Europe disintegrate, will be to have uh, the currency disappear, to have disorderly defaults, to have bank runs. That will be the alternative. And my dear friends, we were in certain moments very close to it. Not only in the uh, countries that have asked for programs. Spain and Italy were very, very close to the uh, catastrophic situations. And then we could have a real threat to the stability, not only of the euro area, but of the European economy. That's why I ask you, and I ask all the political forces that are now going to the European elections, I'm now speaking as President of the Commission, and as my President of the Commission, my party is Europe. I'm not taking sides. But I ask you to have this argument with the citizens. I believe that most of the citizens are reasonable people. They know things cannot come like that easily. And to ask about the alternative. We have been correct in some of the programs. We have in many cases, like in Greece, in Portugal, in, even uh, in Ireland, and also in, in France or Spain, we have given more time for the fiscal adjustment. But if we had not shown from the beginning that those countries were able to correct some imbalances, what would happen was this lack of confidence. Without confidence, there is no investment. Without investment, there is no growth. That's why I'm asking for a reasonable assessment of what were our difficulties and what are still our difficulties. And it's not fair. It's not fair to say that it was Europe that created this, this situation, this crisis. This is not true, or it was the euro. The crisis was the result of irresponsible behavior in the financial markets. 
The crisis was also the result of accumulated imbalances, including the excessive debt in our countries, national level. This was the uh, cause of the crisis. The euro was not the cause of the crisis. We have countries that are not in the euro, like uh, uh, Latvia or Romania or Hungary, that were facing a big crisis. By the way, Latvia now joined the euro area, showing that it is possible to overcome the crisis. Or we have countries like Iceland, that is not even a member of the uh, European Union, that also had a big problem of insolvency. So it's not intellectual nor political correct to say it was the euro the cause of the crisis. It was the European Union the cause of the crisis. No, the crisis was the result of that irresponsible behavior, accumulation of excessive private debt and public debt. And Europe is part of the solution not part of the problem. Can we say that everything we have done was right? Probably not. The European Union is not perfect, and we are here to correct many problems. But what I ask for you and from, from you and from the European citizens is, if you are not happy with the policy, correct it. Explain your position, but do not turn your back on Europe. That will be the, the most uh, mistaken most important mistake to make. There are now some extremists and populists from the extreme right to the extreme left that want to pretend that Europe is a problem. Look at what they say. They are always against openness. They are against globalization. They are against the freedom of circulation, a basic principle that we have in Europe, the freedom to go into other country, to study, to work, to live in that country. And they are all against the European Union. That is something from the extreme right to the extreme left that they have in common. And so I hope that the moderate parties, the mainstream forces, those that believe that these values are something we should fight for, will have the courage to leave the comfort zone and to say, no, we want to, to make this Europe better. We are for Europe. We cannot accept, we cannot accept this policy. We have another alternative. That's great but not put in cause this great achievement that is the European Union, because I sincerely believe that in all our history, even in the history of mankind, there was never a project of peace, of putting together countries that were before enemies, like the one like we have in the European Union. Voila, that was not in my speech, but I felt I had to say that to you now. During these difficult times, we had to promote fiscal consolidation, correct macroeconomic imbalances, ensure financial stability. These are all prerequisites for sustainable, sound growth. Today, we should not underestimate what we have accomplished so far. We have now a European stability mechanism with the firepower of 500 billion euros. This represents the biggest solidarity effort ever in stabilization between countries. We have a safer, sounder, more responsible financial sector that should fully serve the real economy's needs. We are delivering on our promise that taxpayers will no longer be the ones in the front line rescuing individual, individual banks. And we have a strengthened economic governance framework to ensure that countries in the euro area duly shoulder their budgetary responsibility and properly undertake the necessary structural reforms. All these achievements would simply have been unimaginable five years ago. And our efforts, based on a renewed sense of shared solidarity and responsibility, are starting to pay off. Recovery in the European Union is gaining ground and spreading across countries. Activity has started to strengthen, also in the so-called vulnerable countries. I've just arrived from Ireland, where after a successful exit from the economic assistance program, the country is now on its way to pick up on its recovery. Here in Greece, the first signs of recovery are there. Confidence indicators continue to improve. Thanks to structural reforms undertaken in labor and product markets, competitiveness is picking up, leading to expectations for reinforced exports and investments. 
the country should return to growth this year and recover its forecast to gain strength in 2015. As a Portuguese citizen, I have also seen firsthand in my own country the difficulty of working through a crisis. And today these efforts are bearing fruit. There are still big problems like unemployment, but the Portuguese economic recovery is strengthening, employment is increasing, and as I already said, we expect Portugal to exit the program already in May. These first results show that when there is a political will combined with a sense of shared solidarity, there is a way to uh, emerge stronger from a deep crisis. And Greece is on its way to do it. I sincerely believe Greece must continue to implement the assistance program in order to be able to start focusing on defining a growth strategy. It has been very difficult, the adjustment, but we need now also to start a growth strategy. The correction of imbalances and economic reforms are not an end in themselves. They are necessary conditions for sustainable growth, and it's now time for Greece to define a growth strategy, and we are happy to be your partners in that, not only through the task force I've created, now from the multi-financial framework. Uh, Greece has been receiving in these last years 20, over 20 billion euros, 20 billion euros from the instructional fund, from the European Union budget. And this shows that Europe is about solidarity. I know that today in, in Greece and also in many other countries, when people think about Europe, they think about austerity. And I think this is not right. Europe is also about solidarity. 20 billion euros in grants, it's solidarity. And we are ready to continue that effort during the next seven years. Commissioner Johannes Hahn, that many of you, if not all of you know, has, has been visiting almost all the regions of Greece, almost all and he hopes to conclude all of them. So seeing how we can implement now the investment on the ground. Of course, he has come already to the Arctic region, but also it's the biggest region, but all the others as well. So this is the point. We have to work in partnership. I've heard Yves Le Terme, our friend, the Deputy uh, Secretary General of the, of the OECD, mentioning that uh, we should work together at all levels. I think this is a great opportunity to focus on investment. Let's not forget that in some of our countries, the structural funds represent more than 75% of all the public uh, investment, namely on the new member states, the Baltic countries, Central Eastern European countries. So let's now make the most of this new cycle in those partnership programs. And that's where you, the regions, have a very special role to play. I support a stronger role for the regions in the planning and implementing of the structural funds. This is something I've been conveying to the national governments, because as you know, according to the treaty, this is mainly a national responsibility for the governments. But I want these funds to have a much more territorial dimension, because the principle of subsidiarity well understood means that the regions and the cities are better placed to know what are the real needs of people, namely the social sector, than a decision taken by the capital or by Brussels. That's quite clear. So we are developing this partnership approach. I hope that in this new cycle, the money will be better spent than in the past. Because sometimes, let's be honest about that as well, some of those investments were important for economic and social development, but they were not always directed for competitiveness. And so some of the countries that received more funds, like Greece, like Ireland, like Portugal, were not always those that were better prepared for a more competitive challenge. That's why we need to work in those areas that really bring added value. And I think, of course, that one of the most important issues to do now also is the fight against unemployment. This is the biggest drama we have in Europe. One thing is looking at the figures. That's already a problem. But when we think that behind each of those figures there is one person, a young man, a young woman, or a family, or also those who are still in employment but are have fear to lose their employment, that's a matter of human dignity. So that's why we have created this youth guarantee. That's why now you have six to eight billion euros to speed, to front load the so-called youth employment initiative. 
In the beginning of next month, in April, the European Commission will organize in Brussels a new a conference to see exactly what has been done with that money, what we are already doing, the level of preparation in our member states. And that's why, where the reasons can be very important, because I personally believe that it's in my country it's much more difficult to follow this only from the capital, Lisbon, than to have all those who are involved directly in the ground. So let's make the most of it for a youth employment. Let's see how we can implement the Europe 2020 strategy at the ground by the, the different regions. And also, let's see how we can exploit all the potential of the single market. Also, to promote a business and innovation-friendly environment, to boost also our uh, benefits from trade uh, relations and to use the European budget to invest in education, research, innovation and infrastructures. All these are key leverage for uh, job creation. So to conclude, I believe that the active experience of regions and cities has been crucial and that your full engagement is more than ever necessary in the pursuit of the Europe 2020 objectives. I highly welcome your own mid-term review of the Europe 2020 strategy. I also count on your active participation in the public consultation that the Commission will launch to gather the views of all stakeholders in order to develop the strategy further for 20,000 2015 and 2020. Of course, a stronger territorial dimension is necessary. And finally, we have to, in this difficult political moment, uh, we have to make the pedagogy about Europe. We may face a situation that is instinct, a paradox. The economic situation is improving, slow, slow, not enough, but it's improving. But the political situation can get worse. Why? Because the citizens do not feel yet the improvement of the macroeconomic indicators in the daily life. And because we are going to have elections where the extremist forces can uh, gain some power. This is why it's important that we work together to counter the myths and caricatures on Europe and to present our electors with facts and arguments on Europe. To ref That's why it's important to refute extremist discourses. And we need to keep a rational debate on Europe, on what Europe delivers. Subsidiarity is not a luxury, but a key democratic principle. We should better concentrate European action on the real issues that matter and can be best dealt at European level. We also have to be honest what it means to share a currency. If we share a currency, we need more integration because at the end the currency, the credibility depends on the solidity and credibility of the institutions that are behind it. And I was very happy when the day before yesterday I've heard the president of DCB saying that the euro now is an island of stability. Can you imagine some time ago us saying that? So this is why I think it's important to keep Europe an inclusive project for all its members. All the countries have exactly the same dignity. Some are richer than others, yes, but all have the same dignity. And that's why also we need to have the European Union closer to its citizens. That's why you also need to keep a strong cultural dimension in Europe. Culture and cultural, culture and cultural heritage are part of our core values and are also the heritage of our cities. That is why it is such a joy for me to be back in this great city of culture. Europe has so much to thank this country in terms of history, culture and civilization. I hope that also this cultural dimension is more integrated in our European policies. On these terms, we should work for a long-term vision of Europe, uh, and I believe that the next elections will be an occasion to discuss it, discuss with the citizens. And I believe, based on the experience of these 10 years, that everybody agrees there have been very, very difficult years, that Europe has the capacity to resist and to win. My dear friends, it's now fashionable in Europe to have these negative discourses on Europe. Sometimes I call it the intellectual glamour of pessimism. 
Everybody wants to show that's more intelligent than the others, predicting the worst scenario. There is a great deficit in Europe that is worse than the deficit of the budget. <laughs> it's the deficit of confidence. And you know as leaders that you cannot lead without confidence, without hope. So this is my appeal to you. While you are, of course, encouraged and welcome to show the difficulties we have and to have a realistic speech about Europe, let's try to inspire hope in our uh, citizens. Let's be a little bit proud of Europe. After all, we have built the most decent societies in mankind's history with freedom, with open uh, systems, with rights of men and women, with human rights respect. We have this huge problem of unemployment, but Europe should be proud of the kind of societies it's built, and the many from Ukraine to the southern of, uh, of the Mediterranean are aspiring to this kind of society. So to have a little bit pro pride of, on our Europe without being arrogant, is, I believe it's very important. And it's part also of the equation for growth. Confidence is a variable in the equation for growth. Confidence is now improving in investors. Confidence is now improving in consumers. We need also the leaders, the political leaders, to have show a little bit more of confidence and work together for having growth and jobs in Europe. I thank you for your attention and for your remarkable patience because you have heard me so long. Thank you very much. At this point, on behalf of the Greek government,